Uh, yeah, thanks for having me today. Appreciate it. And I, you can see my screen now, right? Yes. Okay, great. So, yep, thanks for the introduction. Um, a little more about myself. I graduated from Virginia Tech um, about 10 years ago and moved out to Colorado and have been pretty much just purely doing bridge design ever since. So I'm going to try to share some of that knowledge today with you all. Um, I can't possibly teach you to design a bridge in an hour, hour and a half or so, but I will do my best to kind of share what, what I think is likely to come up on the SE exam or the PE exam and um, compare versus building codes and maybe point out some, some differences that will help you along the way. So getting started here. Um, outline for the presentation, we're going to first just do a general SE test overview, um, not bridge specific necessarily. You probably have a pretty good idea of how it's laid out by now. Um, and we'll jump into an overview of the uh, bridge topics and get into a little bit of detail on select bridge topics that are, are likely to creep up on the AM portion of this SE exam. Um, <clears throat> and we'll give some general SE exam tips and end with opening up the floor for questions. So if, if you do have the AASHTO guide with you, I'd actually recommend trying to follow along if possible and flipping through to see the different sections. Hopefully you all have it by now. <laughs> um, okay, so a test overview. There is a AM portion and a PM portion for the SE exam for two separate days. The first day is vertical, second day is lateral. The AM portion, which we're going to be kind of honing in on today for the bridge section, there's 40 multiple choice questions and it covers all of the references, bridge and building codes. So this is the same for building and bridge engineers. Um, the PM portion is then specific for either buildings or bridges. The PM portion for buildings has four questions and it's four hours to do them. So we, we recommend targeting one hour for each uh, quote unquote essay question. It's really a, a calculation with explanations. And these, will, this, these questions will be uh, one on steel structure, concrete structures, wood structures, masonry structures, and you're gonna want a good foundation and understanding of multi-story buildings and foundations. Um, so the second day for the lateral, mostly seismic and wind loadings, it's a similar format, four hours, four questions. There are steel structures, concrete structures, wood and masonry, and a general analysis. And for this day, you'll wanna hone your skills on kind of high seismic categories, uh, category D or greater, high wind loads, 140 miles an hour, multi-story buildings and foundations. So here's a list of references. Um, I'm not gonna read through every one, but it hasn't changed since last year. So it's good news if you, you got ready for last year and didn't take it or you're taking it again. And uh, I, I will say it's important to have every single reference that's listed, no matter how few questions may come from it, because sometimes it's as easy as looking into the index and say the cold form steel reference and finding the answer real quick. And that's one more question you have right and better chances you won't have to take this thing again. So AASHTO, um, in the bridge design world, AASHTO is the guide for pretty much everything. It's different from buildings in that we don't have a different code for the separate materials and for analysis. So we have kind of ACI, AISC, um, ASCE all rolled into this one AASHTO code and it's a pretty huge code if you've printed it out. It's probably a couple big binders or maybe you split it up a little bit better. Uh, fortunately, you don't have to know the entire thing 
for the SE exam. It, it typically focuses on a few sections that we use in the bridge world mostly as well. So for the vertical exam on, <clears throat> on Thursday, you will have a heavy emphasis on sections three and four, which are loads and load factors. Um, three is load combinations as well. And then section four covers structural analysis. There will also likely be some questions on sections five and six, which are the concrete and steel design sections. Um, the next day lateral exam, there is again a heavy reference on sections three and four for load, loads, load combinations, load factors, and structural analysis. And there will also likely be a heavy reference on concrete in terms of designing for um, seismic detailing for concrete columns, typically. That, that tends to be a popular test question, I believe. Um, there will be a lighter emphasis on section 6, 10, 11, and 14, which is steel, walls, um, foundations, and joints and bearings. So just starting with some notable difference from buildings and building codes, the load combinations and factors are completely different. They're um, just similar, but different. We have strength, which means ultimate load cases, service load cases, but the factors are honed for bridges and bridge loads. Um, the way that we calculate moving loads <clears throat> is probably something Maybe something you haven't done since school, I'm not sure, but we use influence lines or computer methods to kind of pinpoint the worst case locations of a moving truck along a bridge and then design for those force effects. We'll get into that a little bit later. Um, we have live load distribution and that takes the force effect from a single truck or a multiple trucks and figures out how to distribute that to the girders. But not one one girder doesn't take the whole load. It's a proportion of each of the truck goes to each girder. And there are ashto tables and lever rule and such to cover that. And we'll talk about that later as well. We have um, impact factors, impact loads on live loads. And you can just think of impact loads as you know when you're driving down the highway and you drive onto a bridge, you'll usually feel a bump. It's a vertical acceleration that we just add it's usually 33% of the truck load for that. Um, it can be different and there's a section reference later here in this presentation. Um, for seismic, we for bridges, 98% of the time, we assume a strong beam weak column system. So we'll keep the superstructure, the girders, the deck, et cetera, elastic, and the columns will be designed to hinge and undergo that plastic deformation. I believe that's that's different than typical buildings, though I, I could be wrong, that's not my specialty. <laughs> um, seismic design, spectral accelerations are calculated um, differently. They're They're similar, but different. And then a kind of a random one, but an important one to know is concrete strength. F prime C is always in KSI for for Rashto. So don't use PSI in those equations. Um, note if you have the NCES practice exam and the structural engineering reference manual, you can likely solve most of the bridge questions that come up. They um, they aren't going to be word for word, but there's a lot of similarities between you know, they, they do a pretty good job of representing the problems that are going to be on the exam in those references. So if you can tab or highlight or make some kind of a quick reference for those different question types, that would be helpful. So sections we're going to dive a little bit more into today. Um, section three, the load and load factors. We'll go over load combinations, design trucks and lane loads, and then we'll look at the structural analysis, section four. 
and take a closer look at live load distribution factors, um, the lever rule, and seismic analysis. So starting here with load combinations, um, this is, you'll probably have some kind of question on the SE test and or the PE test on load combinations. It's a, a fundamental thing to understand for, for the bridges. And this table, 3.4.1-1, is going to be your first go-to when determining, determining these combinations. Um, it's, it's worth noting something that I don't typically use in design because the factor is usually one, but it's it tends to be it would be a good SE question is these load modifiers. And this is in section one. So it's it's 1.0 for typical regular bridges. Um, but if there's some kind of a irregular, um, if it's not regular ductility, if there's low redundancy or if it's of especially high importance, then that factor can be greater than 1.0. And that will be a factor that you multiply the design loads by in addition to your load factor. So this, this equation here, 1321-1, sums up how you would include that in a design load. Um, so once you've figured that out and determined it's, it's one or something other than one, you go through and take a look at your load combinations. You've got strength, five strength cases, two extreme event cases, four services. Um, service one is typically the main one. We'll go over what each of these means too on the next slide and a couple of fatigue cases. And there are, note that in some places, rather than numbers, there's these gamma values. And uh, on the page after this table, I'm actually gonna try to jump into Ashto back and forth a couple of times here. This is where the table is. And on the next page, there's a list of what these gamma values are and what they mean for different um, symbols, different load types. So gamma P, which was this first one, gamma P for strength cases, is different for different load types. There are maximum and minimum values. You'll have to either calculate both to determine your worst for force effects or some kind of engineering judgment, just decide which one will control. Uh, and if something to note again is if you are wondering what these all mean, the C, D, W, E, H, you go just right to the beginning of this section three, they're all listed right at the beginning. So let's see, moving on here. A um, couple definitions of these <clears throat> load combinations. Strength one is basic load combination under normal vehicle use without wind. So if you're, this is typically what will control a standard bridge uh, that's not too long under vertical loads for the superstructure. Um, strength two, it's similar, except we don't use the typical Ashto HL93 truck for this one. This is specifically for an owner specified permit vehicle. So that's that's not something that Ashto provides. That's something, you know, CDOT, UDOT, they all have their own permit vehicles for us to check. So if this does pop up on the SE, they would have to provide you some kind of permit vehicle to use. Um, strength three, this is a high wind case where the wind is high enough, it's gale force winds and there's no live load on the bridge. And so if you printed this PDF out, I made a couple corrections in, in red and I can resend this, but the, the wind loads speeds have actually changed in the past few editions of Ashto. I caught this after I'd sent it to you, Katie. Um, strength four, this is a case where you have a high dead load factor and it typically controls for long span bridges. 
Now strength five is a kind of a lower wind speed with concurrent live load trucks on the bridge case. Um, going to service, service one is the, the one that you'll typically see for service checks unless you are explicitly told to use one of these other service three or service two, three or four um, combinations. So service one, it's basically a 1.0 factor for everything. Um, there's a couple exceptions and it uses a 70 mile an hour wind. Um, service two, that's specifically for steel structures and it's to control yielding and bolt slip under vehicle loads. Service three is for tension crack control of pre-stressed superstructures under vehicle loads. And service four is tension crack control of pre-stressed substructures under wind loads. Um, extreme event, we've got a couple cases. Um, extreme event one is specifically for seismic. And extreme event two is for everything else, pretty much. It's ice load, collision, a vehicle collision of vessel or flooding. And it's note that this is for extreme event two is one of these at a time, not all of them. And that the load combination table on the previous page states that up at the top, use one at, one at a time. And that's these extreme event two cases. So moving on to influence lines, um, I'm going to give a general overview. There's, this is definitely something that does come up in bridge engineering. Um, computers have somewhat rendered it less necessary, but it's, it's something that is likely to pop up on the SE exam and that you just need to know. So in engineering, an influence line graphs the variation of a function, such as the shear in a structural member, at a specific point on a beam or truss caused by a unit load placed at any point along the structure. So what that means is, so this, this graphic that's shown here is an influenced line for reactions. If you are, for example, looking for your influenced line for the reaction at point A, then you Take this point load, you start at point A and you move it all the way forward across the structure. And the reaction as you move this across at point A is what this influence line represents. There's qualitative methods to draw these and they're, they're better, they're well explained at this link down here. Um, I'll give you a real quick explanation, but if, if you wanna dive into it, this link is a good reference. So for reactions, if you want to get a qualitative influence line, you will basically just you know, say we're looking at reaction A, you will remove the support and displace the shape up. And then you will just draw the displaced shape of the beam that will result from that action. So if you move this up, then this beam will just move up and straight line down zero displacement at this support and then a hinge here at h and then it will straight line back to the zero displacement at the c support and it's similar for b remove support b move this up and you can just qualitatively kind of picture the deflection of that that beam will come up and hinge at h and back down Um, so similar principle for shear and moment, uh, influence lines, you have to pick a both a force effect and a point that you want to draw these at. So for shear, for example, you would release the shear stiffness at the point or at the section that you are looking at. And this example is mid span of the first span. So by doing that, you are, you're keeping the moment stiffness, but you're releasing the shear, which means the slope at these two points are going to be the same in this line, but it will split and with a 1.0 value kind of up on the right side, down on the left. And then again, you just draw the deflected shape of the beam. <clears throat> and 
and moments. He will release the moment stiffness at the point in question or at, at the section you're trying to determine this for and rotate the beam, keep the shear stiffness so the points are still touching and then draw the deflected shape. That's that's probably way too fast for anybody to really comprehensively understand, but this this link again, if you want to um, work through example problems, this will help you. So moving on to moving loads. We use <clears throat> Ashto has a design truck called an HL93, and that's that's our it, it's not a real truck. It's kind of a statistically driven. Um, hypothetical truck that will yield worst case results for a bridge or the worst case results that we would expect a bridge to see in its lifetime. And it can it um, consists of either a truck or a tandem load in combination with a lane load. So over here we show the design truck. There's three axles, um, eight kips, 32 and 32. The first axles are spaced at 14 feet, and the second axles can vary anywhere from 14 to 30, whatever gives you the worst case. Um, so you will take this or a design tandem load. A tandem is, it's a military vehicle really with a, it's a lower overall load with a very tight spacing of axles and it will only control for shorter bridges. HL93 is, is typically what controls, unless you have you know, 40 foot or less of a bridge span. And you would use either of these, whatever gives you the worst effect in combination with the uniform lane load. So that's, that's for strength one and the other all strength cases and service cases, except for strength two. Strength two is Again, that owner specified or SE question specified permit vehicle. And that that's not something that's, um, we don't have a typical one. It's based on location and based on permit vehicles that a certain municipality or state expects to see on the bridge. So something in addition to the, these eight kip, 32 kip, 32 kip loads, that you'll have to put in are impact factors. And that's the, the bump going up onto the bridge, like I mentioned before. It's in section 3.6.2. Um, and it's one thing to note about those is it applies to all structural members that are not buried. So if you have a, a drill shaft or a foundation that's buried by soil, there are no impact factors applied. Just kind of a, an assumption it gets dispersed to soil or it's it's muted enough that it's not a concern. Um, and then moving loads, we also use distribution factors to distribute this truck to different girders. So methods for placing the truck for maximum moment. This is a it's a moving load, so you kind of step it along the bridge to find maximum force effects at, at locations in question. Um, AISC table 3-23, the last part of that table has a, a guide of, of how, what where your worst case force effect would be by placing um, point loads along a beam. A good approximation for the HL93 truck is to place the center axle um, right in the middle of the bridge. And it's not going to be exactly your worst case. Um, I've seen people put the CG of all of these axles at the center, and that's not exactly right either, but it's close. So just it will, it will end up being somewhere between the two larger axle loads being in the center of the bridge will give you the worst case. And similarly, if you want the worst case at a different point along the bridge, you want to put that center axle over that point. And see, similar for tandem, this is kind of a graphic of a closer space tandem load. Um, and this is the lane load I was talking about. There's a uniform distributed lane load in addition to these point loads for trucks. And that's 
Um, you can patch load that if you have a continuous span and you're looking for a worst case. You get a maximum moment by of a two span bridge by putting a lane load on just one of the two spans, for example. Um, and then Ashto also has a specific uh, combination of trucks and vehicles for negative moment in continuous beams over peer supports. And that's what this combination three is. You, you basically use two trucks with 90% of the load um, spaced with a minimum of 50 feet between the front and back axle. And you add the lane load, 90% of the lane load to that. And that will be your maximum <clears throat> negative moment over the pier. So you, you never use two trucks for one span in a single lane. You just use use it for this negative moment case. And a, a quick reference that um, I actually wasn't aware of that Katie sent me is this Caltrans Design Aid 9-1, and it will give you maximum moments and shears for HL93 loadings for uh, the listed span lengths. I, I believe she sent that to all of you as well. Um, something to note with this is it does not include dynamic load allowance. And another word for dynamic load allowance is the impact factor here in section 3.6.2. Yeah, and I do want to note that the notes that are in red at the bottom of those sheets, I, I put those notes on there when I was studying. Again, I'm obviously not a bridge engineer. So if anybody is having a hard time understanding those and wants to ask some clarifying questions, now might be a good time to do that. Because the last thing I want is to have notes that I put on a document to help me study mess anybody else up. <laughs> so again, if, if you had something where you weren't understanding those notes that I hadn't read and want to ask, feel free to do so. And if not, we can go ahead and carry on. <laughs> okay, yeah, that goes for anything in this presentation. If you if somebody has a question you want to just interrupt and ask, feel free. Doesn't bother me. We'll also have Q and A at the end. I think here. <clears throat> so, okay, moving on. Um, distribution factors. So, live load distribution factors are <clears throat> basically distributing a full truckload or multiple truckloads to each girder. Um, not 100% of a truck's going to go to a single girder in most cases. So this is just a, a method to calculate that. There's simple methods, there's computer methods. Um, we're going to cover the simple methods, which would very possibly pop up on the SE exam here. They're not going to ask you anything too refined. So in order to use these distribution factors and find design loads for your girders, you would follow these four simple steps. Um, so step one, analyze the beam as a single beam with the design live load to determine maximum effects. So that would be using those um, Caltrans table or influence lines along with the HL93 truck just on a single beam. And then next you would go to this table that we're gonna show on the next page to kind of pick a cross section that matches your bridge. And from there, you will go to live load distribution factor tables that, that Ashto has set up. And these tables have equations for approximate, um, very empirically driven uh, live load distribution factors. And they have it for, there's, there's really four cases and there's a separate table for each one of those. So you wanna make sure you're in the right table. Uh, there is moment and shear tables for both interior and exterior girders. That, that'd be a pretty easy kind of got you question on the SE exam if they, they put a live load distribution factor from two different tables, but they're only asking for one. Just make, make sure you're reading the table labels and pulling what the question is asking for. And then step four, you multiply your step one force effects by the live load distribution factor 
and that will give you design shears and moments for the girders. Um, <clears throat> design lanes. So while we don't put more than one truck in a single design lane in a single span, we can load multiple lanes on the bridge and should if we can. Uh, you want to, you can calculate the number of lanes based on this section, 3.6.111. And you, you basically take the width of the bridge between the barriers, divide it by 12, and then truncate that number. So if you had, say, a 30 foot width between barriers, divide that by a typical 12 foot lane. We'll say you have two and a half lanes, but you can't fit half of a truck on there so it's two you design it for two lanes and there there is an exception if you have 20 to 24 foot width then it's two lanes and that's listed pretty bluntly in ashto in this section uh, multiple presence factor is also something you'll you'll want to make sure you're aware of this takes into account the kind of statistical likelihood of having multiple HF full HL93 trucks on the bridge at once in multiple lanes. So you'll see in this table 36112-1 that if you have one lane loaded, you've got a 1.2 multiple presence factor. And as you have more lanes loaded, that factor goes down because it's less likely that you're going to have that full load all at once. And when you use these tables in, in Ashto with the equations, multiple presence is included. If you're using the lever rule or doing some kind of a hand calc on distribution factors, then it's something that you'll need to add in yourself. Multiply in yourself. So here's the cross section table I was talking about from step two here. And this is your first step in getting a live load distribution factor. You want to pick the bridge type that you have um, and make note of the cross section letter underneath because that's going to be a reference in the live load distribution factor. Uh, most, most common types of bridges and really the only ones that I've worked on are A here with the steel, um, steel plate girders, concrete deck, and K down here with pre-stressed beams. Um, however, all these are fair game for the SE. And they all exist somewhere in the world, somewhere in the US. So once you go to here, uh, figure out your section, make note of the, uh, the letter that's associated, go to your live load distribution factor tables. Um, this one, for example, is moment for an interior beam. And this is the label up here is really the only way you're going to know which table is for what case. So make sure you're using the right one. And you'll look in the applicable cross sections for the letter. And you'll see A, for example, pops up a few times. So you know you're narrowed down to these three for A. From there, you'll want to read the, the description and note the differences. So uh, going with the example of A, this first top row is for wood decks on wood or steel beams. Um, that's not too common. Um, the next one, which is very common, is a concrete deck on top of steel beams. It's also applicable for these other cross sections. So it's concrete beams, double T sections, etc. And then this other one, that has the A cross section is steel grid deck on steel beams. So just even though they have the same letters, just note the differences and then the descriptions here. Um, so next you will go to this distribution factor column. They will have plug and chug, very empirically driven um, equations for you to use for both one lane and two or more lanes loaded. So here it's it's important to make sure you've got the correct units because the units don't just calc out. It's an empirical equation with all these kind of random looking um, exponents. And a, a 
quick random tip. If you ever are curious what units are associated with these, these values or just what they mean, there is jumping back to Ashto here in the beginning of every section. So we're in section four. There's a notation section and that lists this takes a second to load, but it lists every single notation, letter, uh, symbol that's in the chapter. Sometimes it leaves out symbols in the commentary, which is annoying, but they, they list both the uh, primary ones. So T sub S was one of the, yep, T sub S was one of these factors, for example, just thickness of the slab. So you could come in here, I'll look through, here's T sub S, depth of concrete slab, and it's inches. And similar for just the rest of these. S would be spacing, L is the length of your girder. Um, you want to make sure that you're falling within the range of applicability here if you're going to use these equations. Um, sometimes, for example, here where NB, which is the number of beams, is three, it will kick you over to the lever rule, um, which is just a, it's a hand calc method that we'll talk about here how to determine the distribution factor kind of yourself with a conservative simplified method. So lever rule. Hey, Robert, real quick. I want to take yes. an opportunity there to um, to highlight the importance in the value in the both the index and the table of contents for the Ashto code. Um, They're like a lot of books, incredibly helpful. Um, so I, I suggest people, you know, find a strategy that works for them as you know as you're doing practice problems you know depending on how you printed out your ashto code um whether it's one binder or two or how you divided out the sections um one thing that i did is you know i put you know i was in two binders so i put a copy of the table of contents and the index at the front of each binder so if i'm flipping through you know chapter four in one binder you know, maybe I'm looking at the index in the other binder so that I'm not having to flip back and forth through the bulk of all the sheets. Um, you know, again, figure out what, what works best for you to save you time. But um, again, just wanted to re-emphasize how powerful that index and table of contents is in the middle of the exam. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Index is your friend. Yeah, and again, we, those sections with the abbreviations at the beginning of each chapter, those are gold as well. <laughs> yes, that helped me in many situations. <laughs> so. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, so lever rule. Let's see, a lever rule involves summing moments about one support to find the reaction at another support by assuming that the supported component is hinged at the interior supports. So this, this graphic, I don't think Ashto explains this extremely well, but um, hopefully you've seen an example or worked through one for this type of thing. Uh, this, this graphic over here on the right, the top picture shows a case for a single truck loaded on a three girder bridge. So this is this is a cross section. You kind of see the barriers up here and the supports represent the girders. The method for, say, if you were to determine the live load distribution factor on this left support, you'd put a hinge at the all interior supports, which in this case is just this middle one. Some moments about here, um, each of these vertical loads, you would set at um, the, the axle load divided by two. Just, just call it P over two, because these are, are two wheels on the axle. Um, and then you would, some moments here, solve for the reaction at the left support in terms of P, and the that multiplier on P, you know, say this reaction is 0.9 P, 0.9 would be your live load distribution factor. Um, that's before you apply the multiple presence factor. So if you had one truck, going back to the multiple presence factor table, that would be a 1.2 factor. So you would take 
the, the calculated 0.9 at this left support that I was going with, multiply it by 1.2, and that would be your true live load distribution factor using the lever rule. Uh, so you'll you'll want to check as many trucks as you can fit between the hinge and the exterior if you're going for an exterior support. If you can fit up to two, then you'll you'll check a two truck case, which would be four four axis four uh, point loads, and reflect the appropriate multiple presence factor. You can fit three to three. You can fit four. That's probably a, a weird bridge if it's that wide between girders, but do four. Um, okay, I think I make sure I covered these notes. Yep, for okay, so for interior girders, you'd assume hinges if it's all interior girder points and um, analyze the deck as simple spans between those hinges. So that would be a case where you had more than three beams. Okay, moving on to deck design. Um, <clears throat> deck design we we typically do with a you know a strip method. We take a certain width strip, one foot strip, for example, transversely across the beam, um, across the beams using the beams as supports, determine moments for the different loads, and check that way. So rather than using influence lines and complicated math and what not to do your live loads. There is a very useful, um, I, I use this all the time, appendix table to get your live loads. And it, it looks like this. Um, it, S is your beam spacing, which is going to be the span length of the deck. And you'll get a positive moment and a negative moment. So your, your positive moment's simple. Your negative moment is, um, it's also simple. It's just based on the design section location of that negative moment. So depending on what girder type you have or uh, how wide the flange is, the design section, which is sketched in red on this right picture, will shift off the center line of the girder. I, I think it's either a third or a quarter, but don't quote me on that. Um, section 46216 will spell it out pretty clearly for you. So if it's, uh, you know, say six inches off the center of the girder, it's where your design section is, you, you would just come to this six inch column and trace down your, your live load flexure uh, negative moment from that column. And this is all on a kip foot per foot basis. So moving on to lateral loads on bridges. Um, I'll, I'll say the most important ones on these are probably wind and seismic, which will, it's not on this list, but it's the next page. Um, but they're all fair game, like always. And I'm sure that at least one of these other ones will pop up. Um, so we've got braking. Um, braking load is applied at six feet above the roadway surface. You have a water load, which is, it's not like rainfall, but it's water in a river going across a pier. Uh, wind on structure, wind on live. Um, wind on structure is, in, in the eighth edition of Ashto, is very, you'll see a lot of similarities between ASC E7 and Ashto. And if, honestly, if you understand the wind loads on buildings, you'll have no problem understanding wind loads on bridges, it's, I think it's a lot simpler. Just you know, make sure that you actually go through and, and note the differences in the, the factors. That was wind on buildings was a, a fun thing for me to learn for the SE exam. <laughs> uh, wind on live, that's, that's a little bit different. That's applied to trucks at six feet above the surface. <clears throat> um, centrifugal force, which um, for those of you that don't know, is, is the lateral load that a truck will impart on the bridge as it rounds a, a curve at speed. Um, you have ice load. 
which uh, I, I, a lot of that again is kind of a river underneath that's frozen that would impact a pier and that'd be a, an extreme event case vessel collision and uh, vehicle regular collision and last but not least seismic design so seismic design again for bridges we, we 98 percent of the time we'll have a strong beam weak column um, structural system so we'll keep the superstructure and the girders elastic during a seismic event and let the if it's a large enough event allow the columns to hinge so some notable differences from ashto to asc7 um, ashto does not take two-thirds of the the uh, sds value or the calculated values to get these sd1 sds design values we use just 100 percent 1.0 times that and a reason is that it's really just specifically calibrated for bridges and it's for a different probability of exceedance. Ashto uses a 7% in 75 years typically. Um, there are cases where I've seen 3% for certain design aspects, but 7% in 75 years is the, the standard. So Ashto LRFD also doesn't we don't say design categories A, B, C, D, E, F. They're, they're design categories one through four. Um, there is a different Ashto seismic design spec that is really the only one I've used, but it's not used on the SE and it's it uses these categories, but ignore that. Um, Ashto LRFD uses zones one through four. The other one is not on the SE. So minimum seat width is also something you'll you'll want to make sure you know where it is. It's, it's a pretty simple equation, and that really just makes sure that the pier or the abutment that the girder is sitting on is long enough so that under a seismic event, that the girder doesn't slide off the seat. Um, and here are some other relevant code sections. Um, loads are in 3.10, analysis 4.7.5. Four and this USGS site. So there's a few methods to calculate seismic effects on a structure. Um, probably not going to have any of the complicated methods touched on in in the SEA AM section. So we'll go over a couple of the more simple ones that you can actually do by hand. So it's more fair game for a morning question. So the first one here is the single mode spectral method. And this will assume uniform loading to determine static displacements. And from there, it's able to determine the period of the structure and the equivalent of seismic lateral load. So just going through an outline of the steps and the um, commentary in Ashto here in 47432. It gives a pretty detailed walkthrough of all the equations and uh, includes these pictures. You wanna go through an example. So step one, you will determine displacements due to a uniform load applied on the structure. So that's, that's kind of shown on this plan view transverse loading. It's a top-down plan view picture, uniform load, and we've got this kind of funky looking uh, displaced shape. And it's it's a six minute question again. So they're not gonna have you find some highly indeterminate displaced shape and integrate from there. It will be something kind of a simple shape, or maybe they'll give you this deflected shape or something like that. Um, Step two, you would take that deflected shape and you would integrate to determine this alpha, beta, and gamma factors. Um, from there, it's a plug and chug into an equation to get your um, you know, the period of the structure. Take the period, go to the response spectrum, 
to, to find your coefficient. And from there, you can determine the equivalent uniform seismic load to apply to the structure. And a, a trick you can really do is you've already got this displaced shape from a kind of a nominal uniform load. You can just scale it up with this uniform seismic load to define to find your design displacements. So that's that's method one. Another method is the uniform load method. So this method uses an assumed uniform loading to determine the lateral stiffness of the structure. And from there is able to determine the period of the structure and the equivalent lateral load. <clears throat> so for this method, step one, you determine the, I should say maximum, but you, you'll determine the maximum displacement of the structure. Um, step two, you will calculate the bridge lateral stiffness. Um, step three, it's again, a plug and chug equation to get the period of the structure. Take that to the response spectrum to get your the um, coefficient. And step four, you can determine your uniform seismic load from that response spectrum coefficient and the, the weight of the structure. And you can, again, kind of scale this up similar to the other method. These methods are similar but different. Um, whoops. So, okay, kind of kind of wrapping this up, wanted to point out a couple of useful appendices. I know we already talked about this one, but it's gonna point it out again. This is for live loads in deck design. You, this is used to find positive and negative moments based on the location of your design section in the girder. The design section is based on girder type, uh, material and flange width. So you don't typically check shear index. So this is just for a moment. It's conservative to take zero if you want to design. Kind of in a, in a design method, that would be more of a PM question thing, I think, though. If if you're given the girder type and the, the flange width, you'll you'll want to go to um, this section here, 46216, to find your design critical section to get the most correct quote unquote answer for the, the AM section question. And um, note that these do consider equivalent strips from table 462131. Other useful appendix is D6. This is just specifically for composite steel girder designs. Um, it's, it's used to simplify analysis of composite steel sections in positive flexure. You can get your plastic neutral axis and plastic moment capacity just directly from these equations. Uh, it's conservative to neglect rebar in the deck for these. And once you get these values, MP is used in flexural design in the steel design girder sections, so 610712. It's not always MP is your resistance. It's similar to buildings. It's 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 based on kind of compactness of the section. Is, is buckling a concern? So MP will be the maximum you'll see, but it won't be <clears throat> the minimum. And yeah, no, uh, it's important to note that practically all bridges are composite structures, at least in this day and age, and likely on the exam. However, non-composite construction sequences need to be considered and can be on the exam. And that's section 6103. We'll cover some of that. Um, generally, what that means is when the deck gets cast on top of these steel plate girders with studs on top, it's it doesn't have any stiffness, it's just dead load. It's not contributing to buckling resistance either. You just kind of have a non-composite weaker steel section. You need to make sure that that steel section can actually hold the weight of the deck and the load, uh, it's its own self weight and any kind of construction live load that may be on there uh, before the concrete stiffens and becomes composite. 
So just going through some general topics that could pop up on, on the exam in the AM. You probably won't see all, but you'll definitely see some of these. Um, vertical section can include temperature and shrinkage, deck moments, influence lines, bearing plate sizes, load combinations, supply strength, pre-stressed beam service stresses, shear and moment design for concrete and steel, and um, factored vehicle loadings. And here's, here's kind of a good gut check for what we'll control. If you're trying to save time, tandem loadings will, will typically govern and shear for 25 foot spans or less, and for moments and spans 40 or less. So any, anything greater, which is the majority of bridges, um, will be the design truck with the three axles. For the lateral portion, things that may pop up is determination of the period of vibration of the structure, uh, wind and seismic effects, minimum seat width, factored wind loads, factored contact pressures for foundations, rebar detailing under seismic loadings, and axial pier forces from wind effects. And just, just ending this with some non-specific Non, non bridge specific rather thoughts and time management things that help me on the exam. Um, make sure you have a watch. There's no guarantee there's going to be a clock in that room and you can either set it to 12 o'clock when the test starts or if you have a stopwatch, same thing just to keep track of time more easily. For the AM section, you're allotted an average of six minutes per problem. You'll, you'll spend way less on some and you'll spend a little bit more on some as well. So I, I suggest spending the first five to 10 minutes just kind of quickly going through each question on the test, uh, grouping them into categories or uh, codes. What code are you gonna have to look in and just knocking any out that you know off the top of your head. Um, I would then suggest completing all questions from a single code before moving on so you aren't kind of jumping back and forth and opening and closing too many books. Uh, if you're completely stuck on something, skip it, save it for later. It's not worth more than any of the other questions on the test. Uh, you're looking for the most correct answers. So it's valuable to be able to do kind of educated guessing and I, I'll say there is out of the four possible answers on this test, there's usually maybe two that kind of make sense and could be the right answer. And maybe one is just an easy mistake that anybody that anyone could make. And then there's two others that are you, you've, you've got to mess up a little bit more to get to. So if you can't get the one exact answer, a lot of times you can at least narrow it down to two or three and kind of guess from there and better your chances of getting a good, getting the right answer. And guessing does not hurt your score. So answer everything. If you've got one minute left, just fill in the bubbles. <laughs> um, PM portion, each question is equally weighted for buildings. Um, you have to show competency in all of them to pass. So if you, you knock two out of the park and you bomb two, you're likely not gonna pass. Just make sure you, you spend an adequate amount of time on each one to show that you understand it. Um, don't spend more than an hour, at least up front on any question and come back later if you have more time. If you get to the last 10 minutes of each kind of hour you have allotted, I'd suggest just outlining the remaining steps that you have and the sections you'd follow or wrapping up details and then moving on to the next one, um, maybe circling back at the end if, if you have time. And make sure you're being clear and provide code references. The easier it is for the grader to follow what you're doing, the, the more likely they'll understand you and give you a good mark. And finally, just Take a deep breath if you're getting flustered. It's it's a lot of stuff. It's a long time, especially if you're doing both tests. So if you need to stand up and go to the bathroom and stand up and stretch or something, just do it and come back, clear your head.
And if you are taking both tests, I'd suggest just having a relaxing night the night before. Don't, there's really no use in cramming the night before. I kind of, I, I got everything organized and ready and kind of skimmed through the indexes a couple of times of, of codes I was less familiar with and just got ready for the next day. And then I, I planned something fun for the, the day after as well to have a light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> It's, it's tough, but it's totally, absolutely doable to pass both of these. Um, so I'll open up for, for any questions here. I hope I didn't take too long. Yep, okay. Does anybody have any questions they would like to go over, whether it be practice problems um, or just general over all questions or something that you um, wish we spent some more time on? Um, it's not really a question, but that influence line link that you had doesn't seem to work. For me, at least. Oh, OK. <clears throat> I'll have to look into that. And, and Try to get you guys a reference if that's true. Shoot. That was a link from, I think, last year. Just assume they didn't take the site down. <laughs> yeah, and while, while we go on, I can see if I might have any of those resources saved down somewhere. But thank you for pointing that out. It does not look like I have, I don't have that saved down anywhere. Um, so if anyone does have um, a resource that they have found helpful for help uh, influence lines, please don't hesitate to share that in the chat um, so that we can support each other. I'll look back on my end too and see if I've got a PDF of something from. When I was studying. Hi, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, so I was doing the NCES official practice exam, um, and there is a question about splicing a beam, um, and they've used bolts on the flanges and the webs, um, and they're sort of asking you to calculate the uh, factored resistance of the splice. Um, so in the ASHTO code, it says it doesn't matter what your loads are kind of, you have to use the um, flange capacity to calculate your uh, splice connection strength. But in the NCES solutions, they're just taking the loads and doing the load combination. I'm wondering what it is that I'm not understanding. I can share it if you want, if I have the power to do that. Um, yeah, I, I think I know the section you're, you're talking about. Let's see. Do you know what section that is offhand in, in Ashto? For splices? Um, yeah. Yeah. I... Connections 13. There, I think I got it. It's 6.13.6. .6. Okay, yep, I think I got that. So, I mean, the, the short answer is you always want to follow Ashtel. That's, that's yeah. what the most correct thing is. Um, let's just make sure that is what it is saying. So it like makes you calculate the capacity of the flange bolted section. Right. There's 
I know somewhere there is kind of a statement that says fix 75% of something or did, did you, do you know what I'm talking about? I might have to do a little more looking into this and I can, I can get back to you. Okay, I can send you the question if you want. Yeah, uh, that'd be great. I'll jot it down as well here. I'll respond. Yes, you know, splice questions is a good topic for the SE test. It's definitely possible to be on there. So any other questions out there? <clears throat> Um, not really a question, but I think that section that you're looking for, um, it's 6.13.1, because yeah, I had the same problem with that um, splice question. I was having trouble finding exactly where um, where it was that you find the, the force to design for, but I think it's, yeah, it's just kind of like a general statement. Okay, yes, this is, that's what I was thinking of here. So except as specified herein, connections and splices for primary members subject to axial tension or compression shall be designed at strength limit state for not less than the larger of the factored force, factored axial force effect at the splice and the factored axial resistance of the member or element or 75% the factored resistance of member or element. So it looks like it's kind of a maximum of type of a, an equation here. You, so for flexural members, which is more what you're looking at, you take either the maximum calculated force effects or 75% of the axial resistance of the, the member, the components. Yeah, um, in the solution, they just, they just take the load, load combination of the forces that they give and, you and they don't- And they, they don't check that 75% resistance no, they, thing. They don't, um, and if you calculate 75%, it's larger than the forces that they um, give you. So it's okay. confusing. That, that could be a blunder. I know I've used that 75% in practice. So. <laughs> totally possible. Do we have any other questions? Uh, yeah, I'm a bit late to the party. I didn't realize it was 6 p.m. in a different time zone. I just wanted to get a little clarification on what HL93 live loading is, because it doesn't seem to really be all that clear to me since I do mostly buildings, not bridges. Yeah, sure. Um, it, in the, it was in the slideshow, but let me bring it up in Ashtell. They They define it pretty well here. Yeah, and I do want to take that segue to, to let you guys know um, we do intend to to share this recording with you guys if there's any section you need to rewind back to. Um, but it, I probably won't get it posted for like a week or two because I'm going on vacation, but wanted to let you guys know that you will um, have access to this recording if you need to go back to it. Um, but bear with me. <laughs> um, and we'll either send you a direct link to like a OneDrive file. Um, 
but more likely we'll try and get it posted to the the SIAC YouTube channel, assuming that uh, Robert is okay with that. And if he's not, then we won't do it that way. <laughs> Um, yep, fine with me. <laughs> okay, cool. So, so this is the section that defines it in Ashtail 3612. And you'll see the HL93. It consists of the design truck or design tandem uh, plus the design lane load. And then okay. further down, you've got the definition of the truck, with the loads, the definition of the tandem, and the definition of the lane load. Okay, so it's the truck plus the lane load, which like the tandem or the the truck plus the line load, correct? Yes, that's correct. And that's per lane. Okay. And that's per lane. So this was the the slide on the. I think you must have missed there. You've got this 0.64 kip per foot. That's your lane load, and then the HL93 is either the truck or the tandem. Got it. Thank you. And the PowerPoint's been sent out, right? I kind of recall seeing it. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you out. so much. Yep. Like I knew the, the time difference was going to get somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? And again, it's a rare opportunity that we get to ask some of these questions to a practicing bridge engineer. So I encourage you guys to, to make the most of this opportunity. The fun game is you're all studying for the same thing. So your question can definitely help somebody else in the room who maybe hasn't hit that problem yet. And Katie, if any questions pop up that you want answered later, you've got my my email. Just go that ahead and let good. me know. Yeah. I think I actually put it at the beginning of this slideshow too. Yeah. Um, and I am going to share in the chat for everyone um, what, it, what should be a pretty short um, kind of feedback survey. Um, we are constantly improve, trying to improve this session and make it um, you know, worth your time because we know everybody's uh, very, very busy studying. So the last thing we want to do is, is have something be a waste of time or, um, you know, you not get as much out of it as you possibly could. Um, so again, I'm going to put it in the chat. It shouldn't take long to fill out. It's kind of a which sections were the most relevant to you? Did we spend too long or not enough on those sections? Um, and, you know, an invitation for any suggestions on how we can improve this event in the future. So, um, you know, since we do still have quote unquote 10 minutes in our scheduled time, if people would be willing to to open up that survey and, and give us some quick answers, I'd really appreciate it. And I'm like, and and I've got a question because I, I know this is something that I hit during practice problems when I was studying. Um, could you speak a little bit more on um, the type of things you might expect from like a bearing pad problem and where to find those in the code? Um, yeah, sure. Bearing pads, I don't think I really touched on that. Um, there is a full section on bearings, joints and bearings, section 14. And I, I, <clears throat> the ones that you will most typically see in practice and the ones that I, I think would be a good question for the code are elastomeric bearings or, or steel plate reinforced elastomeric bearing pads. And just using your handy index, you can find 14, six, what else we got? Um,
Yep. So if you go to 14.6, you'll have a general description of what each of them are, what they look like. And there are subsections for each type of bearing. This internet-based thing doesn't break it down as much as it should, but. So yeah, 14.7, that will be your, your specific bearing types, looks like. You've got metal rockers. Um, a common one is, like I said, these elastomeric bearings, and there's there's two methods that you can use, method A and method B. Either you'll have to be provided with quite a bit of input for these so, um, material properties, maybe the shape of these bearings, and <clears throat> yeah, you can you can find different capacities for rotational capacity. Something point out here that's that's used in the capacity is the shape factor it's it's based on the dimensions of the bearing and that comes into play for the capacity of bearings and it's it's defined let's see si it's either in a or b but not both Maybe. Yeah, here you go. So first, like kind of first equation in method B, they give you a definition of your, your shape factor. And that's a kind of a dimensional factor that's used in the capacity calcs for bearings. So I don't. I don't know if that totally answers, but no. I mean, I. I know. I just would have appreciated a like. Wait, where is it? And what kind? You know, what kinds are there? Yeah, um, and what's so the many kinds? Uh, um, and then, if you wouldn't mind going to, if I'm again, I'm thinking back a couple of years now, and, and just things that helped me while I was studying. But I think um, there's a pretty good section on, like foundation surcharge loads that might be helpful for other sections of the exam if they're you know if you're hitting like retaining wall problems or something like that where you've got a line load or a point load or something load um i think it's in yeah i think i know what you're talking about it's under the load section three um earth pressure here 311 mm -hmm. I think, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if there, yeah, something no, different. that may be one of those, like, I'll have to see it before I <laughs> know for sure. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> this area. Okay. Yep, this this 311.6 goes through a lot of your, your earth pressure surcharge loads. So it's, it'll give you kind of a uniform, simplified, take your, your case of A or your, your at rest coefficient times your uniform vertical load, and that's just simple surcharge uniform calc. Got this more complicated one for strips and points. Uh, live load surcharge, which could be a, a valid question. I think that's vertical section, even though technically it's horizontal. Um, where's my live load surcharge? Live load surcharge, if if you're using it for bridges, we treat it as a equivalent height of soil. Um, it, it used to always just be add two feet of soil and do a uniform surcharge load based on that. Um, they've, they've since changed it for kind of increases if you are closer to it or if you have a shorter abutment. And that's that's all just a uniform surcharge load. Then 311.5 is also, it's not surcharges, but it could be useful for just across the board. 
it has these um it's got your active pressure viral earth pressures and i believe there's yeah these coulomb equations if you want to find you need to find your active pressures for your active uh, coefficients rather and equations for at rest bunch of different retaining wall cases um, some typical values These are all copied from an old Navy code. Yeah. Not Ashto's yeah. doing, but. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm trying to think of what other sections are either useful for this part of the, you know, for an Ashto section or just other parts of the exam where Ashto can be used as a handy dandy resource. Um, yeah, earth pressure is across the board, definitely. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> they love a good retaining wall problem. Um, <laughs> There's a nice, uh, maybe this will help. There's, it's spread out, but there's retaining wall. Kind of a nice graphic with all the pictures of the loads coming in and how you calculate different loads, what factors to use. So, yeah, this is something I've used in the past just to calculate eccentricities and what all loads go into a retaining wall. This is specifically for a backslope, but this would just be horizontal if it doesn't have a backslope. Well, wonderful. Um, and if anyone, you know, if there aren't any more questions, we can go ahead and call it um, but again i just wanted to call attention to some of those fun sections that i i found useful when i was studying um and i want to say thank you to the handful of you guys who have taken the time um to to fill in that survey um if you haven't yet uh, you know when i send out um the recording links i'll send out the survey again as well um but again that feedback is really helpful for us to make sure we're we're making good use of everybody's time here um and, and again, want to say thank you to Robert for, for all he shared tonight. Um, again, I know these review sessions um, were very meaningful to me when I was studying for the exam, and we hope it was the same for every, everybody who showed up here tonight. Um, and so thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you for having me. <clears throat> yep. uh, just one final question. If you've gone through the building manual or the manual that or practice exam that comes with signing up are there any other books you'd recommend looking at to uh just continue practicing uh these sorts of problems is that directed at me like bridge problems yeah uh well, i'm building so i'm probably going to put ashto up and drop it down but i'm not going to say no to that right there was a really great book um that I studied with called Bridge Problems for the Structural Engineering SE Exam mm -hmm. by, by David Connor. I really enjoyed that book. David Yeah, Connor. that's that's right. I was running over to my bookshelf to find that because I knew there was one, in, and that's the one I used as well. Problem. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, um, We'll we'll call it. And again, if anybody has any follow up items, don't hesitate to um, e email Robert or um, email the CXYMG email address. You you got an email from us earlier today, so you have that contact info. Um, and, and and we'll get that to Robert, um, so you can get any follow up answers. Um, and on that note, again, we'll call it. Thank you everybody for being here. Have a wonderful mm -hmm. night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.